So thank you all for coming to share in this momentous occasion. I would ask that members of the media hold questions until after Dr. Rothman finishes his talk. Uh, I'm Bob Alpern, uh, Dean of Yale School of Medicine, and I am pleased to welcome you all here uh, for this uh, joyous celebration. Um, so I will make a few brief comments. Uh, there, there is a great tradition at Yale in cell biology. The, um, it, it was really started by George Pilati, who um, identified a number of key vesicular structures within cells, and uh, using electron microscopy was uh, able to determine uh, what those vesicles did. The, that tradition was passed on through a number of great cell biologists, a number of great department chairs of the cell biology, and the most recent department chair is our honoree today, Jim Rothman. What Jim did many years ago is he had this realization that to really understand how these vesicles moved around in the cell, you had to get rid of the cell. And, and you had to actually study the vesicles isolated. Uh, a lot of people in those days thought that that wasn't possible, that the vesicles would not function in a cell-free system. Jim had the courage to do it and the talent to make it work and uh, led to really a molecular understanding of uh, how vesicles traffic through the cell um, that has exploded today. And so we are delighted uh, with the decision of the uh, Nobel Committee to award the prize to Jim today, and it, it's great to be here to celebrate it. So let me now introduce the president of uh, Yale University, Peter Salovey. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all for being here today, and congratulations, Jim. Uh, we are just delighted. And I have to admit, I personally am a little stunned uh, I'm not being inaugurated as Yale's president until next weekend, <laughs> and I get to have the incredible honor and good fortune to introduce and celebrate with you a Nobel laureate this week. Uh, Jim Rothman represents the best of Yale in so many ways. He's an esteemed professor on our faculty and a summa cum laude graduate of Yale College. Uh, his Nobel Prize confirms, quite simply, what we all knew about him, his preeminence in his field, really his fields of cell biology and of chemistry, um, where his pioneering and innovative work and creative research have really taught us how cells work, and more uh, significantly, the implications for some of the most troublesome diseases and conditions that affect humankind. You know, Jim is a pioneer in many ways. Uh, he, on the West Campus, Yale's West Campus, uh, Jim's Interdisciplinary Nanobiology Institute was one of the first research centers that we set up there. Uh, it brings together researchers in fields like cell biology, molecular biophysics and biochemistry, physiology, engineering, and they're all working on nanomachines that can function within living cells. This activity also has implications for combating disease, for improving life and health of people all over the world. But for all this spectacular research, and for all that Jim Rothman is being honored uh, uh, for today in this Nobel Prize, for all that this represents as a, a pinnacle moment in a scholar and researcher's career. I have to tell you what Jim Rothman is going to do after this press conference. Is he going to go back to his lab and discover something new and important? Well, eventually, but not, not, not an hour from now. 
Is he going to go back to his office and bask in the congratulations of his friends and of his colleagues? Well, he'll get to do that too, but not right after this press conference. Rather, he is going to go teach not one, but his two classes this afternoon. <laughs> and I think it is wonderful, and it is everything that we celebrate in a Yale professor that after winning a Nobel Prize, after meeting all of you and spending a little time with you, that Professor Rothman will head to class to share his knowledge with Yale students, and who knows, in his class, might be a future Nobel Prize winner as well. Well, for now, it's with great pride, with great joy, with the best wishes of the entire Yale community that we celebrate this moment, and I introduce to you James Rothman, the Fergus F. Wallace Professor of Cell Biology, Professor of Chemistry, Professor and Chair of the Department of Cell Biology, Director of the Yale Nanobiology Institute, and of course, 2013 Nobel Prize Laureate, Jim Rothman. Well, this is absolutely overwhelming, and uh, I thank uh, uh, Peter and, and Bob for their wonderful opening remarks. And I'm so, um, it's so nice for me to see the people, many of the people from my laboratory here, actually, and department, and thank you for coming and, and showing your support. Now, I, I'm not quite sure what the format here is. I guess I'm going to take some questions. Uh, maybe I could make a brief statement uh, or so at the, at, at the very beginning. Um, this is... Uh, uh, this is a great university, and this is a great country. And uh, I've been very, very fortunate to have uh, grown up uh, and been educated in this fine place and uh, taught to appreciate uh, uh, taught to appreciate science and intellectual activity at its at its highest. To have uh, matured and started my uh, career as a researcher at a time when uh, your idea was the only limit, uh, any risk could be taken, no matter how, uh, how difficult. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I was fortunate uh, to have taken a few of those risks, and today's Nobel Prize uh, recognizes, uh, you know, I guess, the success that, that came out of that. It's a little, still a little hard to believe this is all happening, I have to admit. Um, and, you know, Bob, Bob mentioned that uh, a little bit about the uh, process of protein trafficking in the cell. And it, I was reminded of the fact that uh, endorphins are secreted. They're stored in secretory. What the theme of today's, one of the theme of today's uh, Nobel Prize is uh, the organization of transport pathways in the cell and, uh, and the storage of secretory products. And one of the less heralded but absolutely critical secretory products are the endorphins, which cause a good mood. Now, everybody has commented on how my mood has been very good today. <laughs> and and, and, my, and my, my, my wife, Joy Hirsch, um, and, uh, has uh, commented that I haven't yet complained today, and it's already <laughs> 12.30. And I think that's because the secretory pathway that uh, my colleagues, Randy Sheckman, uh, Tom Sudhoff, and I are credited with having uh, uh, understood uh, in, in a new way uh, has been stimulated, and so my endorphins are stimulated. Uh, my adrenaline, however, is not yet stimulated. I'm sure the questions will allow that to happen. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, my, uh, my dopamine has been stimulated as a reward system, but, uh, uh, but I'm counting on some good questions uh, from the press to overcome the lack of sleep that came about from a, uh, a call I received at 4.30 a.m. this morning. Uh, shortly after that, I called the dean of the medical school, my boss, Dr. Alpern. He was a little grumpy. <laughs> he didn't pick up the phone right away. But then, I think, something occurred to him, and he called me back. <laughs> and, 
his day has probably been about as hectic as mine has. So uh, I want to I thank all of you for coming, and uh, I look forward to uh, taking any questions that uh, any of you uh, might, might have. Uh, could you raise your hand so I can see? I'm a great believer in eye contact. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, it was, uh, I was asleep, <laughs> okay? Now, in past years, I have not been asleep on such occasions, but the calls didn't arrive. <laughs> As a result, I gave up. I went to sleep very nicely, uh, and a friendly Swedish voice uh, began the conversation, uh, and uh, Professor uh, Hansen, uh, Jan Juran Hansen, the uh, secretary of the Nobel Committee, was kind enough to inform me, and I tried to keep myself on the ground, that I was uh, a recipient of this year's Nobel Prize. And he went on to tell me who I shared it with. And I expressed, as I would like to do right now, my, my, uh, my, my very strong delight uh, in sharing this prize with uh, Randy Sheckman at the University of California, Berkeley, and Tom Sudhoff at Stanford University. Uh, Randy and I, in particular, go back a very long way. We've shared uh, a number of awards together. Uh, and we have, we started our projects, which have been complementary, some would say competitive, uh, many, many years ago, uh, in the late 1970s. And uh, I have found uh, not only uh, Professor Sheckman to be a great scientist, but uh, we've always been very open, and the kind of openness in our, although we've never formally collaborated, the openness in the conveyance of information that we've had, we used to have actually joint research group meetings. Uh, in more recent years, as my work has uh, entered uh, more, taken on more of a tilt towards understanding how the brain works, I've become more familiar with Professor Sudhoff and have found him to be uh, not only a great scientist but a wonderful collaborator. We wrote a review article together that a few years ago for Science Magazine that uh, was a great pleasure. So that call was, uh, was uh, an other out-of-body experience. I could see that it was happening. Yes, yes, you've received the Nobel Prize and all that. I haven't quite digested it yet, to be honest. If you, if you have any interest in the subject tomorrow, okay, if something good in the news doesn't come up, come back and ask me tomorrow. <laughs> yes, sir. Ah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. You know, I was so fortunate uh, to start out at a time when it was possible for a young scientist to uh, have an idea, take a risk, uh, to seem to do the impossible. I, I see Dr. Jameson there in the, about the fourth or fifth road. Uh, Dr. Jameson and Dr. Pilati, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in work that preceded mine, uh, discovered really the, the, the secret, secretory pathways. And, and Jim, you won't remember this, but I remember cornering you uh, at a uh, meeting uh, shortly after I started at Stanford, and I asked you, I, th I said, I'm thinking about reproducing what you've done in a cell-free extract in a test tube. And you told me I was crazy, okay? And, you know, he hired me back many years later, but anyway. Uh, so the NIH was prepared to support me, uh, coming from a good lab, no particular track record, going to a good lab, a good department, uh, but, uh, but with no preliminary data, no nothing. Uh, and I had five years of failure, really, and before I had the first initial sign of success. And I'd like to think that that kind of support uh, existed today, but I think there's less, less of it, and, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's actually becoming a pressing national issue, if not an international issue. I appreciate being asked that question. Other questions? Okay, well, I'm supposed to be, so I'm going to give that a try, okay? <laughs> and that's also a very, very good question. Um, the uh, cells in the body need to communicate with each other, right? If we're, we're obviously very comp our bodies are very complex, and the different parts of the body need to be in sync with each other. And that principle is very fundamental. But each cell has its own boundary, or it wouldn't be its own cell. Your liver has a job, your brain has a job. Within the brain, there are many jobs that need to be done. This requires the, the movement of substances from one cell to another. Probably everybody here is familiar with one of the most uh, well-understood substances of that kind, insulin, uh, which, uh, as you know, is it, very important for controlling blood sugar. 
and when, uh, when, it, when, the, when the metabolism or production or, or, or biological handling of insulin or response to it are altered inappropriately, we can get diabetes, whether it be uh, juvenile diabetes or, or adult diabetes, so-called type 2 diabetes. Um, there are many other substances uh, in the body. Neurotransmitters, for example, are stored in little packets. They're actually like little balloons. They're perhaps 500 hydrogen atoms in diameter. That's how small they are. They have very tiny little sacs. But each one contains a very potent quantity of neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters are released at just the right time and within the brain, at the right place within the brain, in the right neural circuit, so that we can think and act and feel. And when our feelings become out of balance, which can happen in, in, in many forms of, uh, of, uh, of disease, I'm thinking about psychiatric disease, uh, oftentimes this is the result of an imbalance of neurotransmitters. And we treat these diseases perhaps a, a little more bluntly than we would like someday to be able to treat them with drugs that modulate neurotransmitters. Prozac is a perfect example, okay? Neurodegenerative diseases also um, require a provision of neurotransmitter, uh, critical neurotransmitters. Uh, uh, and uh, Parkinson's disease is an example of that. So there are a great many uh, imbalances in these pathways that uh, I, had a, I had a free moment this morning to read what the Nobel Committee wrote. And in their, in their description, they, they point out uh, the many, many uh, ways in which imbalances in these secretory and transport pathways are, uh, are very uh, commonly found uh, in diabetes uh, and uh, in uh, certain immunological disorders. Uh, and uh, certainly in uh, neurological disorders. And the fundamental understanding of these pathways opens the way to assess new drugs, uh, to better develop personalized medicine uh, based on a better molecular understanding and therefore a better prescription of the drugs that, uh, that we have available today. So I hope that at least begins to answer your question. Okay, so the, I don't know if everybody could hear the question. Uh, the question was, how did I hear about the award, and, uh, and how did it make me feel? Well, I mean, I heard about it in a phone call that came at 4.30 a.m. Uh, from uh, the, the secretary of the Nobel Committee, and I have to say it made me feel awake. <laughs> <laughs> and rather good, rather good. Thank you. Well, I wish there were a short answer to that. I'll try to give you one. Um, you know, I think the, the real answer is there is usually not one moment, okay? Because the work that was recognized today, whether it, it was the work that came from my laboratory or the other two laureates, uh, represented a cumulative effort of, uh, of, of research in depth in a topic that went on for, in my case, 25 years, and which I certainly hope will continue. I met with my group today, and I said, hey, guys, it's not over yet, OK? <laughs> you may think we can slack off, but no, 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 OK? Um, but seriously, it's, it's a, these are, to, to address very profound questions in, in nature, uh, these are complex questions. Now, there are certain high points along the way that one can point to, uh, and there's certainly an inspiration to get started. Mine came, actually, when I was a first-year medical student uh, at Harvard. And uh, when I was at Yale, my background, I studied physics primarily and mathematics, and so I was oriented towards machinery, so to speak, and a phys simplifying physical view of the world. And I was exposed as a medical student for the first time to uh, an, s some uh, limited understanding of the complexities that occur within a cell in, in the way that a young doctor would see it. Uh, and uh, actually, I'll always remember the lecture in histology where actually Jameson and Pilates' work was being shown. It was very fresh then, okay? And I thought, my goodness, how could those vesicles form from that membrane and know where to go? And it was a complete mystery how that could happen at a molecular level. And so 
when I had the opportunity and was prepared to take the risk, that's what I decided to focus on. And it was really that inspiration. Well, in what respect? Well, it's, I think it's, it's, it's well under, thank you for asking that. Uh, you know, uh, it's well understood that the, uh, you know, of course, right now, the entire federal budget is under um, restriction because of sequester. But, and I'm not referring to sequester here. Before, that's bad enough. But with, even before sequester, uh, over the last, especially uh, five to seven years, the uh, NIH budget, uh, which we all rely on and has made America the great uh, engine of uh, biomedical discovery and also biomedical and medical innovation, not to mention uh, the, t uh, the generator of our very important uh, biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries, this, uh, th this, this budget has not really grown appreciably. In fact, in real terms, uh, and uh, accounting for inflation, it's, it's actually fallen significantly. I don't have the exact number, but I believe it's in double digits. And in addition to that, um, there has, the NIH has uh, adjusted the way that it spends money, or at least reviews money. And again, I'm not an expert on this, but the end result of it is that a much smaller percentage of the grant applications are getting funded. And it really depends on what part of the NIH and so on and, and frankly, I don't have the exact numbers, so I can't be quoted on them. But it's much, much more difficult, qualitatively more difficult, for young scientists to get started today. Uh, whereas we would expect a young scientist to be on their own on a, and taking a risky project within, a, with a, within about a year uh, of their starting their labs, uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Today, it, it, if they're fortunate to get an NIH grant, it will take uh, several years, three, four years, and the level of funding that they receive is, uh, I believe, in, 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 in relative terms, less than uh, one might have received, certainly I received when I, uh, when I, was, I was started. So I, I sometimes, on occasions like this, when, when I have the, occasion, have the opportunity to reflect, would I have been able to um, do uh, and initiate, take the risk? I really am very concerned that I would not have been. And, and I don't mean to personalize that, because I'm just one example of many people. And, uh, and I see today the, the, uh, the kind of, uh, the enormous opportunities and yet the discouragement that young scientists in this country feel. And it's something that we do need to pay attention to if we want to maintain this country as the great competitive uh, world leader that it has been. I have a hard time giving such advice today. Uh, it's, I, I would say there's always room, to be quite honest, there's always room for, 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 for brilliant young people to be successful. But you really have to be prepared to make a sacrifice to do that. I'm hopeful the situation will turn around. Uh, but I have to say I'm, I'm more measured uh, I'm very sad to say I'm more measured uh, in my, uh, uh, in my, uh, my view of, than, I, than I would have been five years ago, and I hope five years from now, uh, as a result of uh, honest statements such as the one that I'm making right now, that there might be some oppor uh, greater opportunity than there is today. Sorry to pour cold water on a great press conference. <laughs> But I should, I should really finish that by saying that I do have a lot of faith in the United States of America. This is the greatest country in the world. We will, if we all pay attention, enough attention to, in an honest way, we will find a way through this crisis. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we have to. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Once again, we congratulate Jim Rothman. We thank you all for coming. And you see now the charmed life that the Yale president uh, leads. A member of our faculty who is also an alumnus of Yale College wins the Nobel Prize. And our football team is 3-0. Thank you all for coming. To <laughs>